Next, we have Dennis Pennington, our wheat specialist, who has funded half the checkoff dollars and half of Michigan State University in a shared arrangement. So, Dennis, uh, bring us up to date. What's your saying? Good morning, everybody. My name's Dennis Pennington. I'm a wheat extension specialist for Michigan State University. Um, I tried to come up with a nice picture to put on my uh, cover slide here. So I've got red and I've got green. Uh, I don't have a yellow combine up there, but uh, I do have a really proud guy uh, down there leading the pack uh, with his open station combine uh, that's still running. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. So I would like to put up uh, one of my polls and I see that Marty's second poll is still up. So um, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop that one and I'm going to uh, relaunch the poll. Um, and and I'm going to put my first question up here. So one of the first things I want to talk to you about is uh, the planting date and seeding rates. And so first question that I'm going to post up here is if you were planting wheat on September 25th, what would be your target seeding rate? Um, there, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer, but I'm just curious what, what you guys are doing as far as uh, what, if you're planting early and you have the ability to plant early like this, what is the target seeding rate you would be hitting um, at that particular timing? So I see the, the questions are coming in, uh, or the results are coming in. I've got 42 responses so far. Um, I'll give you just another minute to respond and then I will uh, put the results up here. Okay, so here's the results from that. So if you were planting on September 25th, what would your target seeding rate be? Uh, the the 1.6 million seeds got the most votes at 57%, uh, followed by 1.3 million at 27%. All right, so the next question that, um, that I wanna share with you is another planting date question. So now it's later in the season. Uh, if you're planting wheat on October 25th, what would your target seeding rate be? Um, I got to launch the polling so you can see it. There we go. So if you're planting a little bit later in the season, uh, what is your target rate that you're going to plant? I'll leave this open for just a second here so you guys can all respond. Um, and then I'm going to close the polling and uh, I'll, I'll share the results on the screen with you. All right, so I've got about 50 responses. I'll give you just another second and I'm going to end the polling and I will show you the results. So uh, looks like it, uh, October 25th, uh, seeding rates would jump to about 1.9 million seeds per acre. Uh, got the most votes, somewhere up to 2.2 uh, million, actually almost as many votes, um, and a few were still down at 1.6. This is, this is really interesting uh, because this is one of the areas where I think we need to continue to do some research. So um, we have a planting date and seeding rate study uh, planted in the field. Our current recommendations are to plant anywhere between 1.2 and 2.1 million seeds per acre. And the idea is to ramp that rate up as the date gets later. Um, so plant the lower rates early in September, um, then bump it up once you get into early October, and then even higher if you're planting into November. Um, we talk about the Hessian fly free date. Um, Hessian fly really isn't a big pest problem anymore. Um, you can find Hessian fly out there and on occasion, in fact, I was talking to a uh, crop insurance guy a couple days ago and he said that he's had only one claim on Hessian fly in, in the last 25 years um, on one field. So Hessian fly isn't the problem that it used to be, um, but that still from an agronomic standpoint is a pretty good date to want to try to start planting your crop. Um, planting early certainly improves yield potential. The goal is to get two to three tillers um, in the fall. So I've got a seeding rate study and I'm gonna virtually take you out to the field here in just a second. Um, but let me just give you some background on what this study is. We have uh, five different seeding rates, uh, seeding rates of 0 0.8, 1.2, 1.6, 2, and 2.4 million seeds per acre. Um, we tried to hit target planting dates every two weeks. Um, as you might know, trying to hit ex an exact date to plant wheat in the fall uh, is going to be dictated by the weather we had. So these are the actual planting dates, September 19th, October 7, October 18, October 29, and November 15th. Um, they were planted last fall at the Mason Research Farm. The variety we planted was SY100. It's a uh, soft uh, red winter wheat. Um, and in terms of management, this stuff is getting our, what we call our high management uh, treatment. So we got 90 pounds of uh, nitrogen via urea at green up, followed by another 30 pounds of nitrogen uh, streamed down to 28% at feek six. 
it got a Delaro fungicide applied with a herbicide at FIC6, and then it also got Prosaro. Um, just in fact, I still have two planting dates that have not flowered yet um, that we will be putting um, Prosaro on for uh, head scab control. So what I wanna do is I wanna play this video for you. Um, this was recorded on May 15th, so you'll notice that none of the wheat is headed out here yet, um, but uh, let's, let's take a listen to the video and uh, it'll, it'll show you what the plots look like as if you're going to the field with me right now. Hi, this is Dennis Pennington, wheat extension specialist for Michigan State University, out in the field talking to you today about a wheat planting day and seeding rate study that we have in the field. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is the importance of the planting date. Right now, this pass that I'm standing in is our planting date number one. That was planted on September 19th. Now, one thing that I will note is that as you look up the pass, uh, there are four different populations as you go up the pass. So, uh, but to start out with, I wanted to just talk to you about the planting date itself. So this is planting date number one, planted on September 19th. This particular pass right here is our planting date number four, and this was planted on October 29th. So this was uh, about 40 days after the first planting date. Uh, this third pass right here is our planting date number two. This was planted kind of in the middle, October 7th. Uh, and then the fourth pass over here is our third planting date, planted October 18th. And then our last pass over here is the last planting date planted on November 15th. So just to show the magnitude of differences in here, I've got all the planting dates laid out right here in front of us. This is planting date one, planting date two, planting date three, four and five, and you can see what the difference is in terms of development. This plant is at feek seven, almost feek eight. The rest of these are at a, a feek six. This one is barely at a feek six. So uh, planting date has a big impact on, uh, you know, what your yield potential would be. Okay, so the second part of this study is a seeding rate study. So within each pass, each pass is a different planting date. We also have different planting rates. So what I want to do is show you what the effect of planting rate looks like uh, on our, our planting date number five. So this first plot right here is a population of 1.6 million seeds uh, per acre. As I move back to this next plot right here, uh, this was planted at 0 0.8 million seeds to the acre. Uh, or 800,000 population. The next plot back here uh, was planted at 2.4. This is the heaviest population, and notice that at the late planting date, this looks the best and it's the thickest and fullest stand out here. As I keep going backwards here, the next one is a 1.2 million population um, in this plot right here. Uh, and then the last plot right here is a 2 million population uh, of seeds per acre. So there, as you look down the row or as you walk down the row, you can really see a big difference uh, in the populations in terms of, particularly for the later planting date, usually the higher populations uh, really make a big difference because that's part of the recommendation. The later you plant, um, the higher you need to plant in terms of population. So this is Dennis Pennington again from Michigan State University. Thank you for watching this video. Follow me on Twitter at Pennon34 or visit us on the website at canr.msu.edu slash wheat. Okay, so hopefully that uh, came through for you, okay? The next thing I wanted to just touch base on was another study that we have going on uh, looking at leaf uh, canopy uh, architecture structure. Uh, this is, uh, we got some different varieties planted out there on five inch row spacing using our precision planter. Uh, and we have each variety is planted at five different populations. Um, so uh, you can see in this picture, you got two different varieties and the one on the left, the leaves tend to be more upright um, and standing up and, and, and pointed up compared to the variety on the left, on the right, that where the varieties tend, or the leaves tend to be more kind of like floppy. So in thinking about the discussion that Manny talked to us about earlier, you know, we're trying to design a crop canopy that will maximize light energy capture and then the conversion of that energy um, into biomass and grain yield. So we're looking at um, on the narrow rows, are, are there differences in just the leaf canopy or leaf architecture? Uh, and can we utilize that information to make decisions about, you know, particular varieties ought to be planted at, at different row spacings.
So that is one of the other studies you would see. This is a picture of the uh, bean and beet farm taken a few days ago. Uh, this is where we would normally be today. So um, I'll virtually take you out here into the field. Um, but uh, it's unfortunate we weren't able to do this face to face. But one of the things I wanted to uh, mention was a malting wheat study that I have out here. This is the area in the field where the malting wheat study is. And you notice it looks nitrogen starved in your right. And the reason behind that, um, if you're malting wheat, you want very low protein. Well, the protein content in the grain is very closely related to the amount of nitrogen uh, put on the crop. So we have a company that is getting, uh, that's actually building a facility down in the um, southern part of the state. And they plan on taking about 275,000 bushels of wheat. Most people think that beer is brewed from barley uh, for malt, but actually there's getting to be more and more wheat-based uh, beers. And, and a lot of them are, brewers are actually blending barley uh, malt and wheat malt together. So this is an area where there could be additional demand. Um, I suspect that these are gonna be contract grown acres. Um, and so what we're looking at here is different fertility regimes to identify uh, and as well as varieties to pick out, you know, what is what is the best characteristics that for one, we can get a decent yield on, um, but two has the characteristics that the maltsters need in terms of low protein and plump seed. So um, I just thought I'd share this with you. Uh, I don't know exactly how much market that will develop, but if they really do take 275,000 bushels of wheat a year, that that's 10, 15,000 acres a wheat. So this, this could potentially be a, a developing new market here in Michigan. Uh, just a couple things to wrap up here from a, in terms of a crop scouting report. Um, we had some very cold temperatures very late in the season, uh, back in the first and second week of uh, May, uh, which usually we don't get those cold of temperatures that late in the growing season. Much of the wheat was about feet six growing grow, uh, growth stage, uh, which means that one node was visible above the, the soil surface. Um, so but at feet six, that, that node is very close to the soil surface, and that is where the growing point is on the plant. If that growing point was to freeze, um, basically, uh, and it freeze to the point where it, it ruptures the cells and kills it, uh, you would basically get no heads. So far, um, all the scouting that I've done, and I've scouted a lot of fields, I'm seeing just some cosmetic damage like what you see here. Um, a little bit of leaf burn um, and whatnot. When we went out and scouted a bunch of fields about five to seven days after the frost, and at that point we were still, um, we weren't even at the boot stage yet, but when you dissect the stem, this is what the developing head inside the stem looked like. Um, if that developing head is squishy and mushy, that means you got damage. Um, I did not find one single squishy head in all of the, the scouting I did. Now, the one thing when you're dissected at that growth stage, what you can't tell is, is there damage to individual spikelets in there? Um, and if you look real closely, you probably can find on some of your early planted wheat, a few heads that look like this, uh, where there is a little bit of damage and some of those spikelets um, did get frosted um, and, and damaged to the point where they cannot produce the, the anthers and, and the ovary, um, so you will not have seed on them. Uh, but these, these are, you got to really search to find these heads. There, there's really not that much out of there. So we really dodged a bullet um, this year on, on this frost because we had such cold temperatures so late. A um, couple other things I'm seeing in the field, a little bit of barley yellow dwarf virus. Um, that's characteristics by, the, by this leaf with this kind of yellow purpling um, on the tip. Uh, it's not anywhere as near as bad as what it was last year. Last year we had quite a lot more barley yellow dwarf virus. So um, in this, actually, when I'm scouting the plots and taking flowering notes, I've got to really search to find it. It's out there, um, but there's not a lot of it this year. I have found a few cereal leaf beetles out in a few fields. Um, and what cereal leaf beetles, this is a, 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 a larva that's feeding on the leaf, and you can see it causes this window painting damage um, on the leaf. Uh, you got to have um, a very high number of these on, on a plant in order to uh, be at threshold to spray. Um, I am seeing a little bit of them out there, uh, but nothing that's at or above threshold um, at this point. Um, we have found a couple of army worms as well, but nothing uh, of any high levels that, that we need to be out there spraying. Um, there are a couple of sites, uh, particularly at the Tuscola State Yield Trial, where uh, at that location we have our high management and conventional management uh, uh, treatments, and the conventional management gets no fungicides. And we're seeing a fair amount of powdery mildew down lower in the crop canopy. 
And so if conditions stay uh, wet, you know, uh, for a long period of time, that powdery mildew will climb up on that canopy. So far, it's not on the top three leaves yet, uh, which is where I would get concerned. But um, so just be on the lookout. In, in places in the field where you'll see this, if you're scouting for it, go to the headland where perhaps the sprayer overlapped and you got, you know, double the nitrogen application where the canopy is really dense. If you're going to get an infection, that would be where you'd find it first. So those are some of the things that I found in the field and some of the research plots that uh, we have going on. Uh, Dave, I don't know if we have time for questions or not, but I'd be happy to take any if, if anybody has them. I guess I better unmute myself. You have one already um, about the malted wheat, uh, red or white wheat. Uh, I thought malted, malted wheats were hard red wheats. So what kind of varieties are you? working with on the malted? Yeah, so on the, uh, the malting wheats, we are looking at soft red wheats. Um, and actually we have one white wheat in there also. Um, but these are varieties that were in the state yield trial a year ago. And I think four of the five are in the state yield trial again this year. So we're, we're looking at stuff that's adapted to Michigan. Okay. That's all the questions I see and we are running a little behind. So I think we can, uh, Thank you for the update, Dennis. And sure, no always. problem.